It's Tuesday, January 20th, 2015. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, King's Forge. We're King's Forge things. And it's kind of okay. No, it's not. Let's, Let's do this. this. You know, a long time ago, Scott used to give me shit about uh, how I didn't do Club Nintendo and how I just throw my Nintendo boxes away and I just didn't care. Well, that was free codes for me, whatever. But yeah, I mean, it was... Free stuff. Why wouldn't you get the free stuff? Yes, because I in, but now, later, older, wiser, do you want a bunch of plastic stuff? Well, in those days, you know, that was the days where I was so foolish as to spend money on useless plastic stuff. I used to have a lot of plastic useless stuff. Also, Club Nintendo in Japan gave away awesome, worthwhile Well, they gave shit. away that, what, the NES controller that, that was the time? best thing they ever gave away was an SNES controller, a Super Famicom controller, full, real controller, but it was 100% wireless, and it worked with a Wii, as opposed to with any other system. I would have paid like 100 bucks for that. Well, you could pay like 70 bucks and get one. Yeah, but like when it came out... Right, but if you had enough Club Nintendo points, which at the time that this came out, this was like, you know, I definitely would have had the points to get it if it was offered in the U.S. But well, because apparently everyone had a ton of points all the time, but we'll get to that. Yeah, well, I mean, I bought, you know, between... Starting with the, G- the Game Boy Color, right... Onward until the Wii, I bought a lot of Nintendo stuff. I bought the Game Boy Color when it came out, the DS when it came out, the GameCube when it came out, the Wii when it came out, and a lot of games. And I bought, you know, especially a lot of portable games. And those added up to a lot of points. But I didn't get shit for my points. I got like a calendar that I threw out, and I got some washcloths I still use. Those aren't bad. Yeah, well, the thing is, the problem with any program like this is nowadays always that. Can, yeah, nowadays you can get some virtual console games. Ooh. Well, not for much longer, though. Yep. But the problem with all those things is that usually the thing that, you know, savvy people who sign up and try to min max these systems want is just more games for free. Yes. Well, you can get that now, sort of. But, but in. Providing that with any real economy, you just undermine yourself by getting less money from your most dedicated fans. They're going to buy your shit anyway. Right. Well, you know, that's why even now they're giving away games for free, but they're like virtual console games that no one's going to buy, you know, aren't worth paying real money for. So it's like, oh, I can. Because even though I don't want, I'm not, I'm I'm done ever falling for the pay for virtual console game ever again because I can just emulate that shit. But it is nice to have, like, I got Wario 2 for free from Club Nintendo. And having Wario 2 just officially on the 3DS is a lot more convenient than, like, getting out the piracy card. That is true. Get, you know, but not worth paying for, but nice that I got it for free. It wouldn't get me to buy more games just to get that, but it makes me feel good about buying the games I already bought. Because so meanwhile, I get that. on the wide internet, I saw lots of reports. Now, when I was looking into Club Nintendo, when I saw the news I'm about to bring up, that, oh, wow, this happened today. Yeah, today. Oh, yeah. So that a lot of people had saved up codes or purchases to, like, maintain their status, and they were treating this like air miles. Like, right. they were the way it works, really into it. Because the way it works is even though you can spend your points in any time to just get something, your coins, if you have enough coins within a certain amount of time, you set a status. Like, I used to be at the top status, but since the, you know, Wii U and All the, the way up to Rattata? Yeah, top status. Uh, I think top is platinum status. So I was at the top platinum status Rattata. for a while until the Wii sort of ended and the Wii U came out and didn't buy a Wii U. And I didn't buy that many 3DS games. And so since then, my stat has gone down. It's like the gold I realized status. I've only bought eight 3DS games. Yeah. If you're at the top status, there's like just stuff that you just get that you can't get any other way. So here's what I think happened, because Nintendo canceled the program. It's done. Spend all your points. They're all going to get deleted. Uh, If you care about this thing, you probably already know. So that's not the interesting part. But I feel like what happened here on a high level... They're replacing it with something else yet to be determined. They are. and Maybe it'll be better. Maybe they're actually going to do the right thing and offer the same awesome stuff to every country. Or... Fuck over every other country, even Japan. So I saw the. I was reading. I read an article about this, like someone kind of explaining in more detail, like the context and the corporate whatevers and everything. And the one thing that the, the articles all seem to point out is that Nintendo seems to have done this in response to their profit scare because you know recently Nintendo's not been doing well. No. And suddenly Nintendo changes a bunch of stuff when they're not doing well. Most of those changes involve shutting things down or backing away from things. But I digress on that. Mm-hmm. The first comment on two of these articles was a different person, both saying the same thing effectively. 
what if I buy a game between now and when the new program starts up, I better get my fucking points. And they were really, really, really worried about that. Yep. Uh, so as much as I want to say loyalty programs are stupid, uh, obviously people care about them enough to <laughs> dedicate life cycle resources toward them. The most evil thing about the Club Nintendo that I think is that you could, basically, not only did you buy a game, type in the code, get stuff, but... You could fill out surveys. So it's like you did surveys about any game you bought, but there were also other additional surveys. And like taking these things, you got even more points. So it's really Nintendo is basically giving you stuff in exchange for market research for free. Eh. It's very similar to how the grocery store card where you get discounts if you swipe the card and they track your purchases all the time. Yep. And the only reason they do that is because by law, they're not allowed to use your credit card number to track. Yes. So I wonder if you could theoretically get away by using like voice rec face recognition or fingerprint or something aside. Anyway, I digress there again, mm -hmm. too. Yep. So what I suspect happened really here is that Club Nintendo was one of those things they did in Japan because that's what Japanese companies seem to do. Like, it seems like a lot of these like consumer rewards programs in the domestic market in Japan exist primarily because you're expected to have a program like that. You're expected to have this sort of deferential behavior toward yep. your customer. From what I've seen, there's all sorts of, like, stuff. Like, in Japan, there's just lots of ways to get stuff. Like, especially, like, you buy a manga, you send in the surveys, you can get stuff for sending in the surveys. Yep. This contest, you can just enter. Send in stuff, win contest. There's... People well, giving I out that free tissues started, on the street. It's like when, when I started picking up like Japanese anime magazines and things, like in the old days, just because hey, pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. I noticed all those things in there. Yeah, there's lots of just ways to get stuff, and they keep rewarding people with things. I wonder if there's a cultural difference. If is, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm I not mean, Japanese. We have that culture here a little bit, but it seems like they have it a lot more. Well, I wonder if in Japan the reason it wasn't a problem is that people there was sort of this like. Not everyone min-maxed it and went crazy on it, but I feel like in the U.S. at least, the nerds I see who care about these kinds of programs care to an unhealthy degree and go way out of their way to maximize their haul. And I wonder if that wasn't the case in the domestic market. Well, they're, they're kids who have a whole, don't have a lot of stuff, so getting anything for free is, like, amazing to them. Yeah. The same, these are the same people who are, like, fighting tooth and nail for, like, a T-shirt and hanging in the Expo Hall of Packs literally all day. Just oh, you know what I should bring? Do you know how many, like, Halo 4 T-shirts I have from Paxes? <laughs> <laughs> because, people, I'd like, vendors will just give me shit. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to bring it all with me and just give it away at our panel. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> pay, to, I, pay to fly your junk to San Antonio. It, I'm paying to fly stuff out anyway because I think Delta's going to gonna charge us for our check bags. Yeah, you can just bring it to PAX East instead. It, it's the same hassle either way. Not necessary. You can bring it to Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I just want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. <laughs> you know why? Because yesterday I was doing laundry because I got a bunch of, like, right after PAX South, I'm going on a ski trip. So I got I tried to get, like, all my laundry done and, like, set my life affairs in order, likened unto what a dying man does. Uh -huh. And I bumped into all those fucking shirts, and I couldn't tell if they were clean or dirty or if they'd ever been washed. They were kind of wrinkly, and I was like, ah. I don't want to fold them and put them somewhere and then forget about them again. I don't want to wash them. I'll just put them in my bag and take them to PAX. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, Club Nintendo's gone, and I don't particularly personally care because I just threw away my game boxes. <laughs> in other news, in the gaming lands, we talked a little while about GOG.com and the awesomeness of them bringing back the long-lost TIE Fighter and X-Wing. Oh, my God. Problems with that. I just... We'll review those, I think, in depth later, but I do want to mention, if you did not buy TIE Fighter or X-Wing yet, here is my review. Do not buy X-Wing. It is just the prototype for TIE Fighter, and it actually kind of sucks. Mm -hmm. uh, do not buy the later release of TIE Fighter. Well, you don't. You get them both. For the, it, there's no separation you, between the You could the buy them separately. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure you buy them both together. I think you bought as, them in that pack. Uh, it's just TIE Fighter. I don't think they offer, like... I'm pretty sure you can buy the two editions separately. No, it's 10 bucks, and you get TIE Fighter. Oh, yeah, there we go. I didn't remember because I just bought it, and it was a while yeah, ago. It's 10 bucks, and you just get everything. Uh, extra Special Edition and TIE Fighter are separate he listed here. I paid 10 bucks, and I got both. Yep, I'm trying to navigate this side. Anyway, there is a 1994 edition, 
1998 edition. The 1998 edition is garbage, and you should never play it. Mm. The actual good edition is the 1995 edition that they did not re-release. Mm. There is no way to get that edition. Wah, wah, wah. I guess you could pirate it and run it in DOSBox yourself. That might be better. So here's the differences. The 94 edition did something that games did not do well again until Tribes 2. Mm-hmm. It had dynamic music. Mm. It had scarily dynamic, widely divergent music because it was all MIDI. So, like, when a missile was homing in, like, the music would get more intense. When there's fighters around you, the music would change. It would play, like, little riffs and motifs, like, when you take something out. The other one goal just has completed. a red book, uh, you know, CD track, and it just plays it. Yeah, 98 just plays a really bad music pretty much constantly and never varies it. Mm. That alone is a reason to never play the new edition. The new edition uses a different flight model, which just isn't as good and not as fun. It has these ugly textures in it, and I guess they lost the original assets when they made that re-release because all the game menus and everything just look like shit, and all the cutscenes, the sound is quality is bad, and the aspect ratio is wrong. Mm. So just play the original 94 edition or pirate the 95 CD edition. The only difference between 94 and 95 is that 94 is partially voice acted. 95, every single word has amazing voice acting. Mm. Every mission briefing, everything. And the 95 edition is 640 by 480 instead of 320 by 200. That's nice. Yeah. So, GOG.com followed that up today by releasing six more Star Wars games. (sighs) GOG.com Wave 2. Star Wars Battlefront 2, which I think is a game where you're like a stormtrooper and you walk around hitting things. Yeah, never played I that. Don't, I think that's what it is. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, screw that game. There's no point in playing that. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2. N- people really fucking love Knights of the Old Republic a lot. I haven't played the second one, but I tried to play the first one. It is not good. I concur. It is a bad RPG. That I is a takes way too long to play and is completely uninteresting. I don't understand why these games are so ridiculous popular. Uh, I mean, whatevs. Star Wars Dark Forces, which is not that interesting because it's been on Steam for a long time. I have all those games on Steam. And those games are basically Doom, but Star Wars. And they're actually kind of fun. Yeah, they're okay. It's like, oh, you know, you're a stormtrooper. Pew, pew, pew. Right? But... It's like Doom, FPS style. Maybe a little bit better than Doom. Star Wars Galactic Battleground Saga, I think, is an RTS. Who cares? And X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, X-Wing Alliance, the two missing pieces. So X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter was a noble experiment, but it was awful and Right, so when it came out, it was like, holy shit, are you kidding me? It, we had X Wing. We had well, look, Tie Fighter. X-Wing now, was... finally, multiplayer X Wing versus Tie Fighter. Holy crap! X Wing versus Tie Fighter came out three, four, three or four years after like Tie Fighter. I came think out. it was ninety eight or ninety nine. It was ninety seven. It was ninety. Was X Wing versus Tie Fighter? Okay. And yeah, ninety seven. When X Wing first came out in ninety three, the first thing every nerd thought was, "Oh my god, I just want to play this with another human being." Yes. And then X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter came out and was a disaster. Mm-hmm. Just didn't work. Yeah. X- X-Wing Alliance... 99. Yes, it was 99. X-Wing Alliance is way better than X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter. It's twice as fast as X-Wing and TIE Fighter and has a new flight model that's actually pretty good and has a really good story mode. Uh, it was a great game, and I really, really liked it as a kid. Mm-hmm. X-Wing Alliance. Yeah, that's X-Wing the- Alliance also had multiplayer that... I guess worked, but... Was the best multiplayer, uh, but apparently it is not offered according... At least, if you go to G.com and click on X-Wing Alliance and scroll down to, like, the specs where it talks about the game, it says single player. It does not say multiplayer. Yep, so I don't... So I assume that means... See, right there, modes, single player. So I assume that means the multiplayer mode has been removed or is non-functioning. I wonder if it just doesn't work. I don't even remember how it worked. I assume it's just, like, manual IP addresses. GOG is working on some sort of technology. They're using the old Alien vs. Predator FPS as, like, their test game. Oh, my God, I remember that game. That's not a bad game. Uh, They're working on, like, redeveloping game servers, you know, to get multiplayer working in good old games, and that once they get it working in that game and develop the tech, they might be able to get it working for games such as X-Wing Alliance or, 
you know, in a in a holy universe where there is a God, tribes yep. too. <laughs> <sighs> My biggest fear now, because I you know I got a joystick and I've been playing this stuff and Tie Fighter is so good and I'm gonna play X Wing Alliance again because you're not like Rebel Empire or whatever. You're just some guy with like a family and you fly a YT thirty one hundred. You know, basically the Millennium Falcon. Only crappier than Millennium Falcon. Yep. And it's just like half life. It, does, it doesn't do a Kessel Run in even one parsec. It's like half life <laughs> story mode. It's like, well, I got to protect my family from the pirates in the outer rim. And what's the, oh, the fucking empire is getting up in my grill? Eh, eh, these rebels are here. Wish they'd go away. Just want to do my whatevers. <laughs> well, I just join the empire. Then everything will go well. Yeah, I don't think it has a branching story. I don't remember. I haven't played this game since middle school. I mean, if you're just a normal schmo and you don't actually care, high school, like your life is going to be the same either way, really, whether it's rebel or empire. You know, because you're just like farming happily, and no, either side doesn't really give a shit. Then why wouldn't you go with the empire? Because they're just yeah. Waiting. Why not just go with the Nazis? Because they're, they're leaving you alone. Uh, what Naziing did the empire? They do? They killed an entire planet. Uh, that was before this game. After yeah, this game. Uh, uh, <laughs> when does this game you occur, Scott? You don't know about it. When does this game? Everyone knew. How do you not know? Uh, you live on some podunk planet. Yeah, no one here is like, oh yeah, where's Alderaan? <laughs> I, I don't fly around to other planets. So, I actually, X-Wing Alliance takes ship. place shortly after the Battle of Hoth. Mm-hmm. That's where it's set. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. So there's no Thrawn? Uh, probably not. Wah, wah. Fail. My biggest fear is that there is going to be a legit new TIE Fighter-ish Star Wars game because Star Wars is bad. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm playing these a little bit, but if that happens... Well, my fear is that that will I'm happen. I'm not playing them enough to warrant the joystick purchase. And it will be a good game, but it will be designed for a controller and not for a flight stick and thus be bullshit. And it might have a toggle in the settings. Yeah, but like playing TIE Fighter again... I was reminded of how different a game that's designed for a joystick feels compared to a game that's designed for a controller. Yes. Or for a mouse. Mm-hmm. And go joystick. Like If I can't have that, you know what I really want? I want it to come with the console, like in that old mech game, where I have little widgets and buttons to push. Why don't you be that guy who, as your crazy hobby, makes a replica of the inside of a TIE fighter in your house that works perfectly with the game 100%, Including like adjusting the inputs and everything, and then bring it to PAX and show and bring it to Star Wars Celebration and show it off. If and, we quit and Geek your, Nights, a link of your website showing all the photos and videos will be passed around on Reddit. And if you'll get a million I, if hits we and quit shares Geek on Nights Facebook. starting after PAX South, give me two or three years, I could probably have that together. Just do it in your spare time instead of, yeah. I don't know, rock climbing or some dumb skiing shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just get up one of those things and do this instead. It's nerdier. Anyway, things of the day. TED Talks were amazing, and then I kind of got sick of them because a lot of them were increasingly kind of woo-woo or information sparse. Well, the woo-woo ones mostly leaked in uh, in the TEDxes that true, weren't true. very well. Uh... But they were, like even some TED Talks, were they weren't woo-woo in the, like, this is chiropractic or acupuncture, but they were woo-woo in the, this is a really lofty, vague idea that doesn't actually go anywhere, and you obviously paid a lot of money to be involved in all this. Yeah, and also, you people might learn things watching TED videos. I definitely learned things when I did watch them way back Kiki in the Booba. day. Kiki Booba? Yeah. They learned Kiki Booba. I learned a lot of things, but, you know, they seem to be acting like, we're changing the world with these talks and videos and things, and they haven't changed shit as far as I can tell. You'll learn more from a crash course than you will from TEDs. Yes. Fun fact! Scott and I had a TEDx license we never used. We were going to run a TEDx, and then we just didn't have time, and we backed out. Mm. Like, we were, we were, anyway, that was a long time ago. Yep. So, this is a parody of every TED Talk, and it's about the same thing that Seinfeld is about. If you see this, you don't need to see any other TED Talks except for the Kiki Booba one. Kiki Booba one. Uh, and I just want to point out that the top comment on this YouTube video is, and I quote, this guy eats his own shit. <laughs> so watch this video. He probably says so himself. <laughs> it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. All right. So the AGDQ just ended. The awesome games done quick. The annual, well, recently ended. The annual 
spectacle celebration of speed running and also donating money to fight cancer and save the animals in Super Metroid, which is the right way to do it. It was actually kind of interesting because every year so far, Kill the Animals has won in the uh, in the donations because people want to, you know, it's faster that way. So, you know, all these speed run people are like, you got to kill the animals. You can't be saving them. That's slower. <laughs> At the very last second, well, Save the Animals is winning the whole time, but then Kill the Animals pulled ahead towards the end because everyone waits until Super Metroid is actually being played to start donating, <laughs> including <laughs> myself. At the very last possible second, some dude, we don't know who it is, donated like multiple tens of thousands to put Save the Animals over the line, and his donation message was just, get wrecked. Oh my god. I got a second thing of the day. <laughs> okay. I, ben Kachir just tweeted this. It's a super cut of every user, user interface in any in the first Star Wars movie. Okay. Episode four. Every TIE Fighter X-Wing interface. Well, you can use that when you're making your replica. Yeah, I can. Oh, my That's God. That's your reference material. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, continue. So at the AGDQ, there were many amazing things to see this year. But the most amazing of them all to me was Tetris the Grandmaster. So I had known about Tetris the Grandmaster for a long time. It's basically this arcade Tetris version in Japan that you can get. That is ridiculously hard, and there are people who can play it, and they're amazing at Tetris. More amazing than anyone else is the hardest Tetris. Not until I watched this video did I truly understand everything that is to know about Tetris the Grandmaster. I mean, everything I knew was correct. It is the hardest, most crazy Tetris arcade game in Japan. It is far crazier than I could possibly imagine. And in this video, we see what is almost definitely... The best non-Japanese Tetris Grandmaster players demonstrate their skill as and explain to you all the things that I have learned. If you know or care about video games at all, I don't care if you don't like speedrunning. And yes, it is a speedrun, even though it's Tetris, and you'll understand if you watch it. <laughs> you need to understand what Tetris the Grandmaster is all about, because these people are simultaneously the saddest and the most glorious gamers I've ever seen. <laughs> In the meta moment, we are going to be live at PAX South this weekend on Sunday, January 25th at 4.30 p.m. in the Armadillo Theater. We are presenting Bad Games. So bad. The baddest. Yep. And if we get set up early and let the audience in early, we're just going to play uh, Outlaw until the panel starts. Pew, pew. It's going to be a good time. Also known as Pretzel Cowboy. Yep. The book club book is Watership Down. It's a story about amazing rabbits on an maybe amazing I'll, journey. Maybe I'll read it on an airplane. Maybe you should. Maybe When you get to the cultist rabbits, I've I already think you're... I already have already selected the next book club book. Which I've is... selected the next next book club book. Whoa. If, you, if yours is... If yours is a bad book, however, I'm redirecting back toward uh, I don't know. Monsieur Dumas. <laughs> I don't know if mine is bad. I don't know either, but I'm just saying <laughs> Dumas is just hanging out, just waiting in the wings, <laughs> just, just waiting. waiting for me to tag him in. <laughs> Le Comte de Monte Cristo. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway, and I started a new live streaming series and I'm going to keep improving on it. Just people always ask me, well no, one or two people have occasionally asked me well, how to be good at Advance Wars. So I'm putting together a series on how to be good at Advance Wars. And perhaps you can find all the other Advance Wars players and get them together and form a thing. Yeah, maybe we Advance should. Advance Wars speed runs. So you can go to AGDQ next year and, and do the run. Yeah. <laughs> so what I did is Advance one of these Wars videos, won any percent? I played a small puzzle map against myself mm -hmm. to, because the AI is just not good enough to be worth talking about to try to show like. Two omniscient opponents fighting each other, how the logic breaks down game wise. And the first comment in the live stream this was. This guy sure likes playing with himself? Uh, no, that should have been the first comment was, wow, it is amazing how intense this guy is against himself. <laughs> He is really into this. <laughs> and then I realized when I watched it after the fact to see how the stream went, I was playing as Blue, and I'm like, so Blue's probably going to try, he's going to build a tank, because that's the only thing he can do. So i got to build these mechs and do this thing, and hopefully Blue won't go north. And then when I'm Blue, I'm like, so obviously I'm not going to build a tank, because that asshole built, this t you know, built those mechs. So instead, I'm building the anti-air, and I am going north, because that's what he didn't expect. <laughs> It was weird watching myself compartmentalize the two sides. It was kind of it was actually weird watching me play after I made the video. All right. Like super weird. 
other meta things that I can think of. We're going to be at PAX East presenting on Friday, March 6th. PAX at East is ridiculously close to PAX South. 4.30 p.m. and PAX Oz just happened. And Friday- anyway, Boston's also coming up. So is EnkaiCon. Oh, my God. It's yep. convention season has moved from summer to spring. See, Genericon, I know you wanted us to come. This is why we can't come. We're sorry. It's also Netrunner store championship season, if anyone cares. But on Friday, March 6th, also at 4.30 p.m. in the Bumblebee Theater, we are presenting... What is losing what at is PAX losing? East? Well, come to our panel and find out. It, it is, is living with the name of Rim. And it is not just... If your name is Rim and you're alive, my that, losing that is the panel. definition of losing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a panel called Losing at PAX Australia, and this is not You're an not expert that. on the topic. Of I course am. you should be I, doing that. I'm, in fact, <laughs> an expert on losing, for the only way to become a winner is to understand the loser. <laughs> To be the loser. <laughs> <laughs> to defeat the loser, you must become the loser. <laughs> that is where Juggalos came from. Okay. <laughs> so, we played a tabletop game. Okay, so I've played this game twice. I've played it once. It's enough. All right, so what this game is, King's Forge. <laughs> it is made and designed by a person named Nick Sibiki. I think it was a kickstarted game. Uh, it was published. Was it a Kickstarter game? Because I think it was. In my experience... And I'm going to lay down some real sad, ugly truth right here. Mm -hmm. Games that are kickstarted, that are tabletop games, tend to be fucking awful. Mm -hmm. It is very rare that they are not fucking awful. King's Forge was indeed kickstarted. They had a, by game salute, they had a goal of $5,000 and they made $80,000. Guys, don't kickstart board games. Okay, so... King's Forge. What is King's Forge about? Basically, I really like the theme of this game. Everyone is some sort of smith or artisan, and the king wants goods. And you're forging goods for the king, and whoever forges enough goods first is the best. It doesn't matter what you forge. It's just, do you forge stuff? Now, there's a limited set of things to be forged right. that the king will want, and it's Dominion style. Every time you play, you make a you make basically right. a splay of... This is what will be forged right. so it's in like, this There's game. like five things the king wants. If you can forge one of them first, you give it to the king. He's like, all right, I got the thing I want. And even if someone else forges it, which they can't, right? There's no point. The king is like, I already got one of those. Don't need it. So if you show up at the king's door, like at some number of times, three times, four times first, then he's like, whoa, you've been forging a whole bunch of stuff for me. You're the awesomest. Uh, you win. And that's how the game goes. So. Mechanically, it's really very similar to Splendor, only random and bullshit. So, if you look at this game without reading the rules, like you just look at what it looks like, you think it's going to be Yahtzee. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. It's it's kind of cool, you know, physically as well. There's cards with awesome art of different items to make for the king. There's this cool, like, area where you're working to, like, build up your dice. All kinds of different colored dice. Tons of them. You get to roll them. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, the multicolors of dice give you this really good feeling of, oh, fuck yeah, I got some red dice now. Yeah, it's all different. Like, when you're choosing, you're, you can choose a, a little plaque for, like, your player. I always choose the green owl. Owl is an awesome animal, and green is the best color. But there's all these other choices, like purple dragon, and it's, uh, you know, there's all kinds of good stuff going on in this game. But... The bad part about this game is basically in the details. If they had just changed the details of this game a little bit, they could have made it polished and smooth and actually really, really good. But because in the details there are flaws that do not exist in a more tested and proven game like Splendor, what ends up happening is... There's a huge advantage to the first player on the first turn. Most of the time. Most of the time. That will only not occur if basically only hard-to-forge things come out. Yes. Also, there is a huge just luck luck advantage in general. Not just the dice rolling, because you can sort of mitigate the dice rolling. You can't mitigate the, like, well, these are the choices that are available to me on my turn. Yep. You actually have a very limited, like, you have a limited, so basically there's some options that are always out there that you can just do if you want, or you can use one of the options that's flipped up. Right, right. Okay, so here, let me explain it better so people aren't completely lost. Everyone has a bunch of dice. Some of black dice you start with. Yeah, boring dice, crap dice. But you can get better, you can basically, on your turn, you can, if you want to, do something which usually involves spending dice, either losing them permanently or for the turn, 
in order to get better dice that you only will be able to use on a future turn. So, for example, give up three black dice this turn, and then for the next turn, you get a green die. Yep, or give up a green die permanently, get a blue die starting next turn. Right? Then, at the end of your turn, any dice that haven't been used, right, you get to roll. And when you roll them, if you roll adequately enough to match the requirements listed on one of the king's items then you forge that item. So like this item needs three red dice of five or higher and four black dice of one or higher. Right, so you have to A, have enough dice to meet that, first of all, and B, roll them and get that result. So if one of your, if you have enough red and black dice, you roll them, and one of the red dice is too low, uh, you missed it. Yep. You, you don't get to forge it this turn. And then it has this tie-breaking thing. So say I forge an object, and then when we get to Scott, he can forge the same object and his dice on a one-to-one matchup are higher than my dice? Yeah, I have to, every single die I have has to be higher than yours. So even at, let's say it's a very simple one. You need a red three, red at least three, black at least three. Rim rolls four, four. Red four, black four. I roll red six, black three. So I met the requirements. And in fact, if you add up my numbers, I actually have one higher than him. I have nine worth and eight worth. He has eight worth. And we've both met the requirements. But because both of my dice are not both higher than his, every single one has to be higher. I don't get it. He gets it because he went first. Yep. Which is, that is fine. Yes. Except, there, so there's a first mover advantage on taking items. Mm -hmm. There's a first mover advantage just in terms of the objects, you, like the actions you have available to you during the game. And the turn order only rotates clockwise based on the passing of the overdone anvil. Yep. Yeah, the anvil, it's like the game has really good, I told you, construction of pieces. The Whose turn it is marker is a big plastic anvil. I feel like the game was not playtested enough to determine the fact that there are two forces giving advantage to the person who goes first mm -hmm. in the overall game and to the person who's currently going first. And because the you the, the number of things you need to forge to end and win the game, whoever goes first is likely to get the advantage more than other yeah, people. Usually at the beginning of the game, there is like an easy-to-forge item that pretty much anyone could forge on turn one just by rolling all their black die, and it's not any more or less valuable than any other item. But if there's only one or two of these things... The first or a second player is almost guaranteed to get them, no matter what the other players try to do. So obviously the strategy for the other players is to give up on them and spend that turn upgrading to get better items. The thing is, the other players can also spend their turn upgrading and still get those items, and they're just basically one item ahead the whole game, and you really it's very hard to outcompete them unless all of the items that appeared are difficult, and then everyone you know, has to spend their turns building up and can't get anything easily. Yep, and because you basically get, at the end of the, you know, build-up phase, the one roll, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you just get completely fucked. And the only real strategy is deciding, based on how far behind you are, how much you're willing to risk in terms of, like... The game seems to come down to, well, Scott will win on his turn unless he rolls badly. So rather than taking a long shot chance of being able to beat him in case he rolls well, I'm just going to spend this turn developing, bank on him failing. Because I then, have no other choice. Yep. There's no way to attack the other players well, directly other than going before them. So that's the other problem. There are a handful of things that let you attack other players. Oh, that's right. They're very tiny. Because though. there's so few of them, they just devastate individual players primarily for spite and leader keeping and things like that. Like, they're mm. very... Either have those things be common or don't have them at all. I hate games where, like, oh, there's this one way you can attack that comes up sometimes. Yep. Either be an attacking game or don't be an attacking game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look at other really well-designed games, say Power Grid, one of the all-time great games of tabletop in general, it gives an advantage to the first player, right, sometimes... Right? In the house buying, because you get the cheapest house spots first, because you get to go first. Yeah, but then it mitigates but it. It mitigates it because in the auctions, it kind of sucks to go first. Well, look at Sellers of Catan. I get, if you place your house, your first settlement first, you get the best spot on the board. 
You place your second settlement last. Yep. The guy who places his first one last gets to place both at the same time, so he's guaranteed to get the spots he wants. And it's actually super balanced. Mm Mm-hmm. All good games, you know, have some way to mitigate where going first is good sometimes and bad sometimes, and it moves in such a way, you know, that it's not so... In this game, just going first in the first turn of the game is a ginormous advantage, and going first in any given turn is a ginormous advantage on that given turn. So you just try to go first, and then you're going to be very easily winning this game. The rules are also a little bit obtuse. The terminology is pretty consistent, but not great. It took... It took far longer to teach this game than it should have for how complex this game actually is. Yeah, it's actually a really simple game to play, but learning it just took a long time because for whatever reason, you know, the way the instructions are written, the way the cards are worded, those sorts of things, and all the sorts of, like, catchy situations. Like, I had to add, it took, like, a minute to explain, I have a six and a three, it's it's nine, that's higher than his four and four. But he met the requirement, he met it first, and I have to have both of my dice have to meet or exceed all of his. So and also, even if just one of my dice is lower, if every single other die I have exceeds his, if just one is lower, I can't take it away from him. You have he went such first. limited options that you're only, you know, there's there's the fiddly, like, do I do this one thing or this other one thing? But in mm-hmm. general, your decision has come down to, do I invest in this turn or the next turn? Yep. And you have and there's no, not going to be that many turns. You have no other choice. Invest now or invest later. Mm. Everything else is pretty obvious and boring. The way the way Splendor mitigates a lot of this is this in this game you get like what four items or something and it's over and that's it. Yep. In Splendor, it's like you're buying cards like crazy. There's so many things to buy constantly coming out all the time. If King's Forge is like forge a ton of items over 10 turns over forges the most wins and you're forging Craig crazy then that can mitigate so much of the luck because not everything is tied up and like one big item is it it's like oh i'm forging a whole bunch of stuff everyone's forging a whole bunch of stuff and then it comes down to the smaller optimizations in your play as opposed to the random chance i got that one item by luck i win yep and the other problem i had was with the you know you get the semi-randomized set of actions that are going to be available and Mm -hmm. that's the set for the whole game so it it has that dominion aspect of the actual decision is based on the set of actions that are going to be in this game how what is the clearest path to victory however because of your limited interaction with those things and the way the turns work you have no actual choice as to whether or not to follow that strategy right you're sitting there looking and it's like well there's the actions that are already available that that are always available and one of them is clearly superior that haven't been taken yet and then here are the actions that are available at this moment that i can take so you pick the best one and you can't take anything else into account and then as soon as you take one if it's one of the temporary ones you immediately physically take it and another one is immediately revealed for the next player that might be the best one it just happened to appear on their turn and if you hadn't have taken one of the temporary ones you, they wouldn't have seen that the next person would have seen it or someone you know now meanwhile but there's no way to know another game that has a similar mechanical sort of i don't want to say problem but nuance is Hansa Teutonica because if you take a special plate you have to put another one out yep. that the next player... But you can put it in a place where they can't get it easily or yep. it benefits you and so mitigate the fact that you have to put out this awesome plate that you might... Like if it's in, like you, so you get a... You know what I call this? You get a boon, the mm-hmm. awesome boon. Like you, is, might have, you might have taken an extra office plate just to get a plate and then you're forced to put out an extra action plate <laughs> on the board that you really would have rather had but now every other person is going to get a chance to go for that plate before you can even make a move on it. So if you choose to take the boon, the plate, or an action that's one of the temporary cards that's out there, then you have to accept the bust of your the next player, the person to your left, now has an advantage. You get a nudge after that in Hansa Teutonica. You can nudge that bust in a direction that's beneficial to you. Mm-hmm. In this game, you can't do that. And in this game, your only options are take a shitty action or take one of the temp actions, you're always giving the next player. Like, it's there's never a good tactical or strategic reason to take the bad action, the suboptimal one, just to prevent the player from to your left from getting a better right. possible action. So, all right, so on your turn, all you end up doing is taking the best possible action you can, right? And then everything else is completely up to luck. So there aren't really a lot of meaningful decisions once you've figured this out. And it comes down to rolling dice and whose turn it is and what cards appear. 
and it gets pretty close to Candyland among smart people. Yep. So who is this game good for? If you're a gamer gamer, I really wouldn't buy this game. No. I would play it Just occasionally. Just get Splendor, and it's the, almost the same game without the bullshit. Now, because I already know how to play it, if someone else busted it out at a con and said, hey, and you want to play if it? If I didn't have to pay for it, and I was curious, and I was a really big tabletop gamer, I would definitely play it at least once or twice to understand what we're talking about, because there are lessons to learn from this game. Yes. But if you're good at games, I mean, I would play Castles of Burgundy over this. this I would play. Yeah, this game can also have drama. If the if the luck ends up being in the dice rolling, it's possible there could be exciting drama in this game. It didn't yes. happen when we played because people mitigated the luck as much as smart people do. But someone could theoretically just go big, just try to go for it, and end up getting like six, 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 or yep. something crazy, or one, one, one. That should have been an easy grab of that item, but I which, rolled a bunch of ones, and I didn't have any of the automatically turn my dice to six things. Which is fine. I mean, when the goalie scores in hockey, that's amazing. Right. But this game... It happens rarely. I played it twice, and that happened zero times. It was just theoretically always in the back of everyone's mind. It never actually happened. So in terms of the brain feel as a result, like if I win or lose this game... Those two feelings are not different. Because mm. if I win, I feel like it was because of, you know, the luck and the randomness and the yep. order of the cards. And if I lose, it's because of the exact same thing. Yeah, this is one of those games I get frustrated playing. And it's like, I'm usually not, fr I, I'm not frustrated playing a bad game or losing a good game. I'm frustrated when there's a potential for goodness that was taken away. Right? You know how many times when the rules are being explained to us, me or Scott would be like, oh, and then you do X because that would be cool. And then the guy's like, uh, no, actually, you just do Y. Right. This game, if they had just play tested it more, worked on it harder, and didn't spend all their Kickstarter money on a fancy plastic anvil and high quality pieces and high quality arts and all the other things that actually are kind of good about this thing, if they had made the game better, then... This could have been like even maybe even competing with Splendor because that dice part actually, you know, but they failed. So something interesting. I went to Board Game Geek just to see if there's any interesting notes about this. The top post about this game is Shill Alert. The King's Forge 7.38 rating seems bogus. So many fake 10 ratings. Quote. I almost bought this game today, uh, blah, 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 blah. But then I came to look at the game comments before I pulled the trigger. I noticed that seven of the nine BGG users who gave King Forge a, King's Forge a 10 had no avatars or badges of any kind. Okay. And appeared to be new accounts. All right. <laughs> they had no comments and didn't uh, blah, blah, blah. And then he posted a bunch of evidence. And Yeah, I mean, people kickstarting a game are very likely to... You know, this is, my work is actually having the same thing. We have, like, apps in the App Store. Ah. And it's like, should we go submit fake ratings? And I'm like, I'm not. And I think it's, you know, do you just want to be dishonest and evil if you do it? But if I'm I like, made go, it, don't go. I think it's a great app? <laughs> right. But it's like, go for it. Go submit your, you know, fake, you know, review that you want for your own app to try to boost it up in the App Store ratings. Yeah. Instead of letting it live on its own merits. Just don't click on your own ads in YouTube or your account is going to be fucking shut down. Yeah, well. All right, we'll talk about that the, another ad, time. At least the AdSense part of your account. Yeah. They'll still let you make videos. <laughs> but uh, I guess King's Forge reminds me so much of Ground Floor. Mm. In both games were Kickstarters with really high production values. Mm that obviously did not get a lot of playtesting, and the rules were written by people who obviously don't have a lot of experience with, like, the history of tabletop game rules as written by everyone else in the world. Uh, they make a lot of amateur mistakes. There's obvious flaws. There's usually, like, a fixed rule or errata that comes out pretty soon after the game. Yep. Like, in, in, uh, like, the thing that was in Ground Floor that was really broken was that advertising thing. That like that part of the game where you'd like put your yep, like, yep. dude. I forget exactly yeah. what it was no, called. I know exactly what you're talking yep. about. Yep, because it was designed so counterintuitively and so stupidly that players wanted to ignore it because it wasn't fun to deal with. But because the rest of the game was badly designed, it was actually the only thing that mattered. Mm -hmm. Ground floor is very similar in that I, there's no way this game got a lot of playtesting, or if it did, only amateur hour people playtested it. Right. Like, my, I'm gonna be blunt. My guess is that. Sort of what we're seeing here with a lot of the kickstarted board games is there are people who play games, who are making tabletop games. And the things with video games, there's at least a barrier to entry to where you need to learn how to code or at least learn how to use Game Maker 
you know, you need to you know something. You need to have some specialized knowledge to make a video game. Yep. And it takes a while. So this barrier to entry, where it's kind of hard to make a well-produced, completely bad video game, right? If you've completely produced and you know well-made a video game, code and art-wise, you must know something. Kind of good. Well, you know, we were just at an event at Microsoft where we got to demo a whole bunch of like unreleased indie yep. video and tabletop games. You know what? The unreleased, like, didn't put a lot of time into these yet and far from polished video games were almost universally amazing. Yep. You could Meanwhile, definitely, you could see unique things in there that were worth, you know, that if they just, you know, worked on them some more, they were going to, could turn into gold, like Nidhogg level gold. Meanwhile, and I'm going to, another ugly truth here, almost every tabletop game that is indie and unreleased that I have ever play tested or played or done a demo of with anyone has been awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Almost every, there are exceptions like Jeremy's game he's working on is actually really good. Yeah, no. Or uh, uh, Jeremy's game is better than any yeah. tabletop game I've demoed. <laughs> or like uh, that weirdo Luke Crane when he made us play that tabletop game that one time at Ubercon. <laughs> yeah, that role playing game. Yeah. <laughs> or then now like you know the uh, the mouse swords game, Swords mm. and Strongholds. Yep, but like, those are made. That's made by a real game maker. Exactly. Yeah. The barrier to entry of tabletop is low, so a lot. A lot of tabletop games get kickstarted with really high production values. Well, also, you don't need to be a good tabletop game to make a lot of money. Look at Munchkin. Munchkin is the king. Yeah. Cryptozoic is the king. Yeah. And P that's what people are going for. They got $80,000 to their Kickstarter no matter what. They have the, the money. The thing is, if I were budgeting to make a, a tabletop game, it would be more than $80,000. They, they asked for $5,000. Yeah, if I were if I were this, you know, this is me, the product manager, like you know, all the other work I do in my life. If I were budgeting a company to make a game like King's Forge and sell it for real, my budget would be about one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars minimum. Probably. So you need at least just sixty to pay the salary of the game designer. Yes, a game designer for a year, a dedicated game designer who is an experienced game designer. Right. That's 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 half the money. Yeah. And then contracting out art, and then extensive playtesting. Playtesting that takes longer than the game design, maybe? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one more. This, this actually reminds me of one more thing. So in Netrunner, they have the draft, which is like they uh, you buy cards. It's sort of like in Magic drafting. You, yeah, You buy yeah. cards, you open them, you pass them around like Seven Wonders, and then you play. So they charge money for this, and it's not the one the official draft is not very good, and it costs a lot of money to play. So it's very hard to get people to do it. We did it once, and that was sort of it in New York, at least. Uh, so what some people do is they make a cube, which is a thing people have done in Magic, where it's like make your own, you know, draft, you know, pile of cards and pass it around, and everyone will draft out of that. And that way we don't have to pay money. We just take cards you already own, put them in a pile, and we can have all the fun of drafting. Without whatever. Yep. And I was like, the guy's like, oh, yeah, my cards are all... I, I get into a discussion with a dude. He's like, oh, you don't... Why don't you want to play the cube? And I'm like, I'm, <laughs> dude, it's basically the same thing we're talking about here. It's a game made by a player. Yeah, okay, Netrunner wasn't made by the player, but this cube is like, how do you know your cube is balanced? What kind of rules you got for this cube? He's like, oh, but it's been made by... You know, Magic players have been doing this for a long time. It's like, I don't care. You know, the card selection, how much have you playtested this? You're basically asking me to be a playtester. Yep. You know, but people really like doing it, despite how crappy it is. Yeah, I mean, guys. The same people that like King's Forge. We will playtest your game either if you're a close personal friend or for money. Yeah, We're not like, going to playtest your game at a con. Yeah. And it's like, and the guy brought, like, his cube to, like, you know, the next Netrunner night. He's like, does anyone want to play my cube? And it was like, nope, no one wanted to play his cube. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, this this is this is you know we did that panel how to win at games. Remember how we talked about uh, if you understand games truly well, you ruin most games yeah. for yourself. <laughs> if you get good at games, you're gonna sound exactly like us about the ninety percent of tabletop games you ever play. Yeah, yeah I told that guy the story of like tribes too that you know basically the pl that let the players get what they wanted and Counter Strike which didn't let the players get what they want. Yeah, he still was not convinced. He was like just so. Adamant about his cube and how, oh, his great, cube. how his cube drafting was so great. Oh my God, his cube gate. You're denying him entry. I know. <laughs> cube Gazi. You can't say gate anymore. <laughs> no gates allowed. It's all Gazis now. <laughs> Only Gazis allowed. <laughs> This 
has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. It's Tuesday, January 20th, 2015. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, King's Forge. We're King's Forge things. And it's kind of okay. No, it's not. Let's do this. You know, a long time ago, Scott used to give me shit about uh, how I didn't do Club Nintendo and how I just throw my Nintendo boxes away and I just didn't care. Well, that was free codes for me, whatever. But yeah, I mean, it was... Free stuff. Why wouldn't you get the free stuff? Yes, because I in, but now, later, older, wiser, do you want a bunch of plastic stuff? Well, in those days, you know, that was the days where I was so foolish as to spend money on useless plastic stuff. I used to have a lot of plastic useless stuff. Also, Club Nintendo in Japan gave away awesome, worthwhile Well, they gave shit. away that, what, the NES controller that, that was one the time? best thing they ever gave away was an SNES controller, a Super Famicom controller, full, real controller, but... It was 100% wireless, and it worked with a Wii, as opposed to with any other system. I would have paid like 100 bucks for that. Well, you could pay like 70 bucks and get one. Yeah, but like when it came out. Right, but if you had enough Club Nintendo points, which at the time that this came out, this was like, you know, I definitely would have had the points to get it if it was offered in the U.S. Well, because apparently everyone had a ton of points all the time, but we'll get to that. Yeah, well, I mean, I bought, you know, between, starting with the, G- the Game Boy Color, right, Onward until the Wii. I bought a lot of Nintendo stuff. I bought the Game Boy Color when it came out, the DS when it came out, the GameCube when it came out, the Wii when it came out, and a lot of games. And I bought, you know, especially a lot of portable games. And those added up to a lot of points. But I didn't get shit for my points. I got like a calendar that I threw out and I got some washcloths I still use. Those aren't bad. Yeah, well, the thing is, the problem with any program like this is nowadays always that. Can, yeah, nowadays you can get some virtual console games. Ooh. Well, not for much longer, though. Yep. But the problem with all those things is that usually the thing that, you know, savvy people who sign up and try to min-max these systems want is just more games for free. Yes, well, you can get that now, sort of. But, but in providing that with any real economy, you just undermine yourself by getting less money from your most dedicated fans. They're going to buy your shit anyway. Right. Well, you know, that's why even now they're giving away games for free, but they're like virtual console games yeah. that no one's going to buy, you know, aren't worth paying real money for. So it's like, oh, I can, because even though I don't want, I'm not, I'm, I'm done ever falling for the pay for virtual console game ever again, because I can just emulate that shit. But it is nice to have, like, I got Wario 2 for free from Club Nintendo. And having Wario 2 just officially on the 3DS is a lot more convenient than, like, getting out the piracy card. That is true. And get, you know, but not worth paying for, but nice that I got it for free. It wouldn't get me to buy more games just to get that, but it makes me feel good about buying the games I already bought. Because so meanwhile, I on the wide internet, I saw lots of reports. Now, when I was looking into Club Nintendo, when I saw the news I'm about to bring up, that, oh, wow, this happened today. Yeah, today. Oh, yeah. So that a lot of people had saved up codes or purchases to, like, maintain their status, and they were treating this like air miles. Like, right. they were the way it works, really into it. Because the way it works is even though you can spend your points in any time to just get something, your coins, if you have enough coins within a certain amount of time, you set a status. Like, I used to be at the top status, but since the, you know, Wii U and All the way up to Rattata? Yeah, top status. Uh, I think top is platinum status. So I was at the top platinum status Rattata. for a while until the Wii sort of ended and the Wii U came out and didn't buy a Wii U. And I didn't buy that many 3DS games. And so since then, 
My stat has gone down. It's like the gold I realized status. I've only bought eight 3DS games. Yeah. If you're at the top status, there's like just stuff that you just get that you can't get any other way. So here's what I think happened. Because Nintendo canceled the program. It's done. Spend all your points. They're all going to get deleted. Uh, if you care about this thing, you probably already know. So that's not the interesting part. But I feel like what happened here on a well, high they're level... They're replacing it with something else yet to be determined. They are... And maybe the, it'll be better. Maybe so they're want, actually going to do the right thing and offer the same st- awesome stuff to every country or fuck over every country, even Japan. So I saw the I was writing. I read an article about this, like someone kind of explaining in more detail, like the context and the corporate whatevers and everything. And the one thing that the, the articles all seem to point out is that. Nintendo seems to have done this in response to their profit scare because, you know, recently Nintendo's not been doing well. No. And suddenly Nintendo changes a bunch of stuff when they're not doing well. Most of those changes involve shutting things down or backing away from things, but I digress on that. Mm -hmm. The first comment on two of these articles was a different person, both saying the same thing effectively, what if I buy a game between now and when the new program starts up? I better get my fucking points. And they were really, really, really worried about that. Yep. Uh, so as much as I want to say loyalty programs are stupid, uh, obviously people care about them enough to <laughs> dedicate life cycle resources toward them. The most evil thing about the 